the sort of equate dropping the uh, beer cells in there at the very end is to a dropping a bomb like that. I know you guys have been working on this. Yeah, and we, and we told you um, this question's come up, and we, we wanted to be methodical about it. We wanted to take our time to do it right. It wasn't a race to just do something um, without proper preparation, and I felt like by having a couple of years to, to sell it at Stegman, and do it at baseball last year, we were able to work through uh, some of the logistical challenges of it and be better prepared. It's not something you want to rush into. And, and during that same time, we were able to take a lot of notes from our peers, the things that they went through, um, you know, best practices. So I feel we're ready and prepared uh, to take that on this fall. Is it beer, wine, and alcohol, or just beer? Yeah, so first thing to note is the SEC de did deregulate what can be sold. So th theoretically, anything can be sold in the SEC, but we're going to focus on the same protocols we've had before where it's really just um, beer and like the what you would call the seltzer type products. We're not looking to go beyond that. Um, right now. Is that deregulation really in effect for this football season? That deregulation we're talking about will be in effect for this fall season. Mm -hmm. I don't have the data on what schools are doing what, but I know there will be a few yeah. um, that do everything. The uh, other two important questions of that, one will be available in the press <laughs> And two, do you, do you have any idea how much it will cost? I'll you know, everybody out. yeah, it's going to be reasonable, but at the same time, in all honesty, um, you know, as we've talked about concessions being family friendly and trying to take care of a family of four or five coming to a game, this isn't something where I feel that it's got to be um, that price or making it cheap is important. This is a luxury item, not a necessity item, so it's not going to be um, something that we value price. It'll be fair and in line with most of our peers, but um, this is not something that I put up put a thought process on making it a value item. You mentioned, you know, taking notes on problems that other schools have run into and best practices. What are some of those things that you've noticed over, you know, the research that y'all have done? Yeah, I think it all started when the SEC first launched it. The, the policy was, um, was you had to pour it in a cup, and I think what they found was uh, the timing it takes, the, the, the delay, and then making sure – that you move those the sales to areas you don't really want to take over your main stands with it. You want the families and people to still occupy the, the main such that you want to move it to other areas. And if you have to walk a little further to get to it, no big deal. So really, it was it was a lot of logistical things. But we have seen talking to our peers across the country that um, alcohol-related incidents have gone down, and we hope with time that this will change people's behavior. And the ultimate goal, and what you've seen nationally, um, is. A reduction in binge drinking when individuals know they can have a drink at a game and that's the ultimate goal is to hopefully curb um, that behavior um, on the um, on the track facility just a quick question uh, did, did you was that did that land have to be purchased did you already own it it's part of the university's land okay so the university already owned the land I'm, I'm trying to be clear you said it's adjacent to is it across, across the street from soccer softball across, across the street just being being clear exactly. on that. so it'll really create uh, like a precinct of Olympic sports precinct where it'll all be with those sports being all together out there. And y'all are thinking about in, indoor in the future possibly? Potentially, yeah. This, this focus right now is just on the outdoor facility. Do right you now. have any numbers on what this, uh, like what Nothing you matters. fundraise it or what you think it'll cost? Yeah, I, I don't I don't like to get ahead of myself with those because I really like to fine tune those in before. I always want to share those with the board first before I share them anywhere else. But uh, will, will the, I know you just moved that track offices and stuff over here too. That'll stay where it's at right That'll now. That'll stay where it's at. Yeah, and they, that's a home facility for them because it's close to the grab and go, it's close to the training room, other things. So that's kind of their home base close to campus, um, which they like being on campus for that facility. So it works out well for them. I, uh, I apologize for all these kind of minutia questions, but I am trying to get my arms around, you know, the unbelievable progress from a facility standpoint. I mean, like virtually every part of the department is being touched. And uh, so the Stegman stuff, do, do you guys still have any numbers on how much you've put into improving Stegman, fixing the fixing the roof, you know, fixing the ceiling, and then you've done all the painting and you're doing, so you're talking about a phase 1A the, now and you got a phase yeah, 2 Yeah, so coming. the phase 1A, I don't have a number on that yet. That's something we'll come to the board with in May. Um, the the ceiling repairs was done in joint work with the university, so I don't have those numbers top of my head. But I can tell you when Mike and Abe first got here, we committed $4 million to him. President Moore and I said, let's commit $4 million right off the bat to improve some things. And that went into 
uh, re revamping the, the sports medicine area that you y'all walked past, the new weight room that hopefully you've been able to see. And then, as you see, we're still continuing to make improvements in the event level spaces, locker rooms, coaches offices. So we really stretched that $4 million pretty far. And then again, phase 1A is going to focus on light sound and that new video board. So phase one is not going to begin construction, assuming it gets uh, funding until like April of it 2025? Won't, it, it won't take place until the earliest will be 25. Like yeah. after the season? After the season, yeah. What's the uh, Butts Mayor uh, Champions Hall thing? Is that, that's, is so that that's number the, two? Uh, oh, that just a, Tanner was that that was probably a couple million. Two million? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, you know, look, when you when you talk about an area like that, that's that was something that Greg wanted to do for a long time, right? But we put an emphasis on improving things that directly impact our student athletes' lives and fans. This was didn't you know it, it, this was hard to get over the to do that, but we wanted President Warren and I discussed wanted to have a way to honor Coach Dooley, and we felt this would be a great way to to, to tie that together. So as you come in there, and it's going to be done in the next couple weeks, you'll be able to come in there and see there's a great area dedicated to Coach Dooley celebrating our championships and things. So. It was really a much needed modern feel to what we've now branded as a circle of champions. So um, I invite y'all to come in and look at it uh, whenever you have time. I think you'd be really impressed. The old space had really gotten tired, and so it needed this work. And honoring Coach Dooley just seemed like a perfect time to get it all done. President Moore, what is the universities or Georgia Athletics or South uh, sports betting that's working its way through the uh, legislature? Uh, what is the position of the GA? You know, I haven't studied that bill at all, so I, I can't really comment on it. Uh, I'm not familiar with the details of the bill. Josh, do you have a? I've not say, I honestly, I've not. So you guys, do you guys, whether it passes or it doesn't, like you don't have a position on it. Well, I mean, it's not for us. We're not the. I'm not the lawmaker. It's, right, but with college sports betting and um, you know that being obviously there was a former LSU player that had a. Uh, issue uh, from his time there um, recently with him using the news. So. Yeah, I just don't know the details of okay. the bill. Okay. Uh, let me just ask a question regarding um, some of the lawsuits. I know I'm not going to get into it too much, but there's been accusations of NCAA violations regarding um, the crash in the aftermath. Uh, has Georgia found any violations uh, related to that? I'm sure our lawyers would say that we shouldn't discuss any pending litigation. So okay. uh, that would be my answer. Gotcha. Thank you. Got a couple more questions, anybody? That's Todd Felton's story. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions. I've got to save some stuff for my book when I'm tired. Yeah. But, no more um, questions. <laughs> no, I, I, I do want to just say um, how much call it means to all of us. And you all know that, right? I mean, it's. Uh, What's special about the University of Georgia and Athens is that we're able to have people like Coach Julie, Coach McGill, Claude Felton, people that love this place. And I think as we look forward to, you know, Tanner, myself, others, Matt Brokowski, of wanting to be those people 20, 30 years, you know, it's special to have people that have connections to Georgia, whether it be through a degree or living here a long time. Um, Claude is an example of that. And I think that's what makes our athletic department and university is so special with so many people that have a connection and love and care. Because when you love a place like Claude loved Georgia, um, people are selfless and they do what's best um, for the department and for the university, and not just for themselves. And Claude was a great example. Uh, and we're thankful for everything he's done. I'm almost hesitant to ask you that because, so, of, well, because of time constraints. <laughs> just, uh, you know, Tennessee is, uh, it, it seems like they're in a mud wrestle right now with the NCAA over NIL. And is it, is it, is it as confusing as it seems about what the rules are regarding NIL, what you can do and what you can't do, and who polices? that especially with such a lack of transparency about what everybody's doing well you know will lawler who uh, leads our enforcement office uh, does a great job of uh, consulting with the ncaa and uh, seeking their advice and counsel on uh, matters so i think will would tell you uh, that uh, that we have a pretty good understanding at Georgia uh, as to what is and is not permissible uh, with respect to NIL. 
Uh, but I, I haven't studied the Tennessee lawsuit yet, so I don't know exactly what they're alleging. Uh, the state attorney general there, uh, you know, to comment on it. Uh, I do know that the NCAA uh, has um, a special group uh, that is studying reforms uh, to NIL. In fact, Josh is a part of one of the working groups that has been formed by the NCAA. Uh, and uh, we just came out of our last board of directors meeting with some new rules related to transparency uh, for NIL agreements, which did pass the board of directors. There'll be some more things that will happen this spring, uh, but, um, you know, it's an ongoing review process uh, that President Baker uh, has undertaken with, uh, with the board uh, on that subject. So, um, but I don't know enough about the Tennessee lawsuit to comment on it. That's, that's two things, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Carl.